let's go ahead and get started. <laughs> Thank you guys for hosting Ron Simon last week. I had rough duty. I had to go to Hawaii. Yeah, but he told me you gave him a hard time. Uh, um, one announcement. Uh, the next guest speaker is next week, Ed Shulman, who's the head of pulmonary at Drexel. And um, uh, Genentech's hosting him, and we're having a dinner the night before. I, everybody hopefully in the room and everybody out on the outside listening. Uh, if I didn't send you or forward the invitation, anybody who wants to come that evening is invited. It's uh, uh, Cafe Campania at 6.30 downtown by the market. Uh, and then we're having a professor's rounds to follow with a case presentation for him after his presentation <coughs> on Tuesday, so similarly anybody who can stay for the second hour. Uh, today, actually, you know, we've called this for 40 years Journal Club, but uh, it's rarely journals anymore, but once in a while it is. So today it's journals. Uh, we've got three speakers this morning, all on very different topics. It looks like Bill is up first, and let's try and save time for everybody so we get through all the presentations. Um, so, I've got a potpourri of uh, articles. I, I guess it should have been titled maybe Molecular Engineering. It's um, just some provocative new articles on power of immunology and uh, some things in the future for diagnostics, uh, immunotherapy, and uh, maybe changing ways cytokines are operating. So, this was uh, actually a couple of weeks ago, Nature Med. They highlighted uh, a couple of Jackie articles and also some biotech companies that are developing uh, peptide immunotherapy, in particular against um, cats. And I guess there's uh, the ones I'm going to be highlighting were the Jackie articles from um, Vienna and the Barry Case company, and um, then there's a couple of the companies, one in the Bay Area and one in Vienna too. They're also using similar approaches. So this was the first one that came out uh, earlier this year in Jackie, um, where they, from Vienna, where they looked at intra-lymphatic immunotherapy. Um, they said the Nature Med uh, reviewed these papers that this person has not obtained uh, pharmaceutical support for future studies, so I don't know if he's gonna continue on with this, but uh, there's a lot of literature suggesting that you can get a more bang for your buck if you give the um, RNA, DNA, oligonucleopeptides intra-lymphatic. Um, you can get a um, more robust immunologic response that way than giving it to uh, sub few other uh, forms. And it's been shown in um, some prior studies in mice, monkeys, and humans. So in this um, study, they took the recombinant, the major um, cat saliva, uh, sebaceous hips, protein, LD1, fused it to it, this um, translocation sequence from uh, HIV virus. And that facilitates uh, cytoplasmic uptake of this peptide. And then they also fused on the human invariant chain this, um, to create this antigen transporter that goes right into the endoplasmic reticulum. It bypasses the uh, um, phagosome, so you prevent degradation. So that probably gives the extra immunogenicity of this uh, approach. And then they did a phase one, two, a study to look at um, <coughs> the effect of this compared to um, intralymphatic linguinal um, and immunotherapy with placebo. So the patients were all had a history of cat allergy, positive skin pricks. They had a nasal provocation test to the cat antigen. And it was um, two parts of it. They gave them increasing, let's see, where are the, uh, sure there's no way to move that. Uh, the People on the outside can't see it. Probably now, I'll just describe it here. You can see that in the middle of it, they got increasing doses from one, three, 10 micrograms over the treatment period. Um, okay, well, that's good. 
and now the people outside can't see them. They had typed them initially with um, the screening visit with um, skin prick testing, uh, intradermal testing, dilutional titration to see what uh, dose induced the um, positive lumen flare, and then that was one of their parameters to see with the immunotherapy could they tolerate a bigger dose of that antigen. Um, they also did some in vitro T cell responses. And then the main um, group, so they had an intermediate time point uh, several months after initiating treatment, and then they had a one year follow up of a subgroup of the patients. So they're the two arms of um, this fused cat protein in alum, 12 patients, and then the alum without any. Uh, they had quite a few dropout at the time points. They were limited their <coughs> power, just 13 patients seen at the 300-day uh, time point. So some of the things that they noted, five weeks after the third intra-lymphatic um, dose, they noted that there was an increase in the uh, treatment group of um, IgG class 4. There was no change in the uh, IgE levels. And they noted that the patients had um, increased, if they isolated their purple blood mononuclear cells, increased production of IL-10 as a reflector of uh, T-regulatory cell infection uh, by the immunotherapy. And they correlated the increasing titers of IgG subclass 4 to the doses of uh, IL-10 that were seen after treatment. They didn't note any other changes of other cytokines by their um, immunotherapy. So they showed, and they also had some um, in vitro other studies where they showed that uh, they could uh, block like basophil histamine release with the um, peptide. So but the main thing was um, some tolerance studies that they did after the treatment. So this was looking um, with these different challenges of uh, what happened to the patients, their symptoms. So they looked at a nasal provocation test where they put in cat allergen to the nose and then they measured nasal airflow and then also symptoms. And they had done that at baseline and then after this, um, this was like a four-month treatment when you added it all up. And there was a significant increase in the amount of allergen that was um, needed to give the same provoking dose in the uh, cat peptide treated patients. And similarly, the um, skin prick test dilutional titration also and the ID uh, met statistical significance too, meaning increasing doses were required to elicit the Willem Flair response. <coughs> they lost so many patients by the um, 300-day follow-up, there was not a statistical power. So there were, this was looking at quality of life, like nasal symptom score and high symptom score. There were some trends for reduction in the cat-treated group in the dark bars, but none of them reached significance. So um, first study of this kind of a treatment, um, I don't know how attractive it would be for us. You have to do the intralymphatic um, inguinal lymph node by under ultrasonography, so it would not be a easily applicable test. More difficult than sublingual. Pardon? More difficult than sublingual. Yeah, the, the beauty of it is it would take uh, three doses of this treatment versus you know fifty to hundred of conventional sub Q immunotherapy. That's the main reason why they lost patients. Is that um, I think it was just because they started from. They didn't comment on that. They said that the. Um, Tolerance of the intralymphatic treatment was less than a venipuncture when they surveyed the patients. Yeah. And they had a previous PNAS paper where they'd done this with uh, a grass allergen tied into a peptide like this, intralymphatic. So the, the more recent one, um, so this is a group, uh, Circassia Biotech in Oxford, and it was a study partnered with McMaster. So, um, well, those are just the take-home points that I've already summarized on that. So this is the, this other study. This one is a different approach um, where they looked at a mix, they call it cat pad or immuno, 
tolerant, I think is the name of their, Tolermune is the other name of this other company. Um, and it's an equal molar mix of seven peptides of Del D1. I'll show you that in the next slide. So um, what they did is their main, um, they had a previous proof of concept paper in Jackie a year previous. And um, this one was looking um, at the dosing range and to see what kind of persistence of like, benefit on um, rhinoconjunctivitis scores after challenge. And these patients were um, cat allergic, very mild history of asthma, and just a small number. Most of them were just pure rhinoconjunctivitis. Um, and they were given an environmental chamber exposure um, before and after a three month treatment period with these mix of seven peptides. Um, so their primary outcomes are the clinical efficacy in these symptom scores at 18 to 22 weeks and then 50 to 54 weeks after treatment started. So the, they've had a lot of background in this work. Barry Case started all off trying to do um, T-cell epitope mapping of um, major allergens. And so what they did is it, in light up here are the two chains of Feld one with all the amino acids, and then here's the second chain. And then they, um, their first study, they had like uh, 20 different peptides. And then they, then they mapped them and they found out that half of them were not um, interacting with MHC class two uh, recognition molecules. So they dropped those from the mix and they looked at um, a wide range of MHC proteins that would mean that um, you could get like 90% of the, of the general population would potentially react to these uh, peptides. And so the, all of these colored bars are the different fragments of specific uh, MHC class two molecules. And the hatch bars are the regions that are interacting with the um, cat structure, the peptides. So like for example, one of their peptides of their seven in their mix starts with the CPA and ends with FLT. So they're like 15 to 20 amino acids. So this guy here is the one interacting with that. So they've got seven peptides that span pretty much the both chains of Feld one And another one of these complicated um, studies, but their major thing was their previous study was looking at um, was three nanomoles of the cat peptide every two weeks with eight injections. And then they doubled that up. They had showed some efficacy in the previous study with that versus placebo. But it was a good thing in this study they had the other arm where they gave twice the amount, six nanomoles, but less frequently every month for a total of four. The same number of total antigen given. Um, so they had this treatment period, and then during which they had a they figured out all their baseline rhinoconjunctivitis scores um, prior to treatment, and then they did it um, again, it was 18 to 22 weeks, and then a smaller group, there's about 100 people who did this, and then um, half that did, were retained in this group after a year. So it's real complicated um, study to read, but um, what they did is they then had a scale of uh, rhinoconjunctivitis scores from sneezing, the degree of it, and also the eye symptoms, tearing. And this is the baseline up in the top. And there are three groups, the placebo, the three nanomole group given um, two weeks apart, or the six nanomole peptide four weeks apart. And the first thing is <laughs> they know just a baseline before any treatment. Um, these are the arbitrary scores of the total rhinoconjunctivitis symptom scores on the y-axis. And then the time of being in the chamber. So these are uh, four hour, three hour exposures in the environmental cat chamber. And the amount of cat protein they're given is um, 50 units that's equivalent to what you would find in someone with one cat in their house. I guess it ranges from 10 to 200 of these. I forget if it's nanograms per cubic meter of air, I think. So they were kind of right in the mid zone of what a patient would be experiencing. 
They noted that there was a priming effect so that um, the symptom scores uh, went up after the fourth day of challenge from like peak of fourth, I don't know, I think it was like 12, 13 up to 16. And then the symptoms also on like the second and third day of the chamber were occurring more rapidly after they got in there. And what they noted at, so the middle panel here is the 18 to 22 week after treatment. And then this is when you're followed at the bottom. And what they noted is that um, the only group that showed significant benefit was the um, six nanomolar or peptide every four weeks. Surprisingly, they didn't make any comment in the paper, but their comparative group with the three nanomolar, which was efficacious before, and the previous paper was not helpful here. This is the same um, intra-lymphatic injection method? No, these are standard set of Standard. Um, so the, the other thing that's noted is that um, after a year that this was persistent in the uh, treatment group in the bottom there, and also that the amplitude was markedly less, whereas before they had a total of um, 16 or so as their symptom score. By the one-year treatment, it was down to seven. So it's quite a, that part was the most striking part of the data because I guess they used this parameters and other traditional sub Q immunotherapy for grass allergen and you only get like a, um, I guess average of around three to four <laughs> symptom score reduction. This was like a five. So that was probably the most impressive part of the data. Hey, Bill. Yeah. None of these patients had asthma? Yeah, they were all allergic. They had to have, um, positive skin test and then a, a positive environmental chamber test when they put them in with But no asthma. I guess they no had asthma. asthma. No um five five percent had asthma. It was really mild and it was a really restrictive study. They couldn't be on any um inhaled corticosteroids with the trying antagonist. The only thing that was allowed was Loratity. Um for the patient So the um and then this is the one-year take-home point showing that compared to placebo, the six nanomolar treatment group with just four injections had this uh, significant, it's about a, you can see that much improvement in changes in the symptom score versus the placebo group. So um, they've now, in the Nature Med review of this paper, they said that the uh, company has just announced um, a phase three study um, in Canada, U.S., and Europe of uh, 110 sites, and that was announced uh, two weeks ago. So this will be, they're expecting their study results in 2014 uh, with the six nanomolar uh, dose. So I just got to, want to split this up so everyone has about 20 minutes, so. Before you oh, go, has, has anybody looked to see if the regional draining lymph nodes, when we inject in the upper arm, is that where the stimulus is occurring with conventional subcutaneous immunotherapy? Or maybe the reason it's not working is because we're not getting enough to that regional lymph node group, and it, we should stick it in the lymph directly. Yeah, you definitely, uh, you want the action in the lymph node, but it uh, would be tough to do I would think in the upper arm like that. The reason the inguinal nodes are more accessible. Right, but I just wondered if anybody has ever biopsied a node to see if there's actually transformed lymphocytes in there that are responding to the allergen that we're administering, because the regional node should be the place where you take up the allergen. Only thing I know is when they did, um, I think it was um, Steve Durham, they had a paper where they did immunotherapy um, before and after Bronco Lavage, they looked at um, they just BAL. They were trying to, you know, there's nothing with like Bronco Lavage nodes. And in that one, they also did skin boxes after immunotherapy, and they showed that the um, T cell cytokine profile changed from a TH2 predominant to a TH1 after one year of immunotherapy. Those are skin biopsies and BAL. It's, uh, I don't know if any other data that's looked at the tissue. Well, when I read this, the article from the guy in the Netherlands that's doing the intra inguinal lymph nodes, and it's three shot therapy and it's yeah. one shot a year, you almost think if you could put a catheter like we use for a porter cath or something like that, just into a regional lymph node group and inject your allergen right in there, whether we could do it similarly without having to <coughs> use ultrasound to find out where you're going to stick people. And, yeah, because you, know. you can put the 
the beauty of it, he said, is you can give much less antigen, right. plus they're fused so that they don't cause a mouse cell degranulation with these other, um, like HIV or other people, have, they've tagged uh, hepatitis B, um, non-infectious particles that limit the immune response um, to them. So you markedly less risk of anaphylaxis with that approach. And plus, you know, the beauty of these three injections. So the, just to conclude here, um, there's been um, some interest in, a lot of interest in food allergies, and uh, this is caught my eye about a month ago, PNAS paper where they made a transgenic cow that's deficient in uh, beta lactoglobulin productions. So the um, there's two main protein types of proteins in cow's milk: um, the casein, the solid part that curdles, making cheese, or the whey that remains after the milk curdles. And that um, if human uh, breast milk doesn't contain a beta lactoglobulin, but the ruminants, the cows and sheep do, um, they try to limit that. It's always thought that that part is particularly allergenic because beta lactoglobulin is very similar structurally to the major mouse and urine allergens. It's also nearly identical to the cockroach um, major allergen and also um, horse um, protein. So they engineered this uh, cow named Daisy uh, to produce milk free of beta lactoglobulin. It was a really cool technique. The same method that they used to make the daisy, um, the dolly sheep. So they took a um, fetal bovine fibroblast and they <coughs> transfected it with um, a promoter for, specifically for the mammary gland. And then they knocked in these uh, small interfering RNAs that knocked out uh, beta lactoglobulin production. And they did this uh, really cool manner in mice before that, and then they ramped it up into the um, cows. They had these uh, unfertilized egg cells that they inserted these in. They got 57 cloned embryos. They had five pregnancies, and this one offspring, um, Daisy, um, surprisingly was born without a tail, so they don't know what that's about. <laughs> but, when they, uh, when they looked at it, um, the cow's milk was totally deficient in that beta, -lac beta lactoglobulin. Um, and also, surprisingly, the, all the casein components were ramped up. So the alpha, beta, and the um, kappa caseins in the transgenic cows were um, increased. It's not FDA approved, so no one's tasted this yet, so we don't know what the taste of the milk is like. The, this was also got a lot of press, and in the interview, the um, <coughs> guy who did it said that they are testing it for whether it is allergic. This is in New Zealand, so I don't know if they've got some sort of clinical study where they're doing the cow's milk allergic patients there. It's never been, it's always been a big controversy, you know, what part of the cow's milk is allergic. Mm -hmm. They interviewed Hugh Sampson and Bob Wood after this, and they all poo-pooed the article saying there's so many other proteins in cow's milk that you could be allergic to that this didn't have any relevance, but get the right one. I don't know if that's true or not. So mm -hmm. the, maybe this will enter in clinical trials at one point. I'd better break off here, but the uh, <laughs> it just shows that we're not ready that for humans yet. There could be some unintentioned uh, uh, problems from the cloning. At the last one, Bill. I have some others, but uh, that's good. <laughs> we better call it there because I know that Audrey's got a bunch. <laughs> While we're changing speakers, I think I forgot to mention to the outside audience the word of the day. Drew, you said it was election. Yeah. Okay. So if you want to CME, the word of the day is election, and it's not supposed to be political event. <laughs> Make sure you vote. Yeah. <laughs> do we now get CME for journals? Because we used to not get. Yeah, CME. you do get CME for journals now. suggested that I talk about component diagnostic testing today, and so for interest of time, I narrowed it down to looking at peanut allergies, and I have no disclosures today. So, so far, we have um, two major ways of looking at whether a patient might have food allergies. We're familiar with skin testing, and um, it offers the advantage of having lower cost and increased sensitivity compared to the serum immunoassay. 
It also has advantage of, of broad, diverse um, extracts that can be used either commercially or you can use the prick-to-prick -prick method um, of using fresh foods. Furthermore, it also has the uh, pro of uh, allowing immediate results. Serum amino assay um, is convenient, particularly in uh, clinical settings where there's skin testing that's not available in primary care settings. Also, we don't have to worry about whether our patient has taken <laughs> any stains. And it's also useful in patients that may have dermatographism or extensive eczema. And it's also quantitative. The limitations of these current tests are the following. Um, first, it, as we know, just having a positive skin test or a positive IG to the food doesn't necessarily mean that one is actually clinically allergic to it. And so sensitization um, is all that it shows versus allergy. And so we need to use oral challenge as the gold standard. And obviously, it's very laborious, time-consuming um, in order to do these studies. The other problem with the current testing is that you have a kind of gamish of, um, in the allergens. So when you're testing, you're not really sure from batch to batch that there's no standardization. So you may have ones that have more of a particular allergen versus something that um, another product. And so really, you're not being able to determine which part of the allergen is being recognized. And then this also leads to the possible cross-reactions. So as we know, some patients may be allergic to legumes. Um, so when you see a peanut allergic patient and they're coming up positive to other legumes, is that real or is it because they're having shared protein homology? Also an oral allergy, that could be a problem as well. So if they're pollen allergic, is it that they're possibly um, not truly allergic to the food itself? And then as we know, the testing has limitations of determining the severity of reaction. So all we know is that the diameter of the skin test wheel or the level of the IgE predicts the likelihood of reactivity, but doesn't say what kind of clinical reaction they would have, if any. So this brings us to a, a sort of new wave of diagnostic testing, and it's called component <coughs> result diagnostics, and it's abbreviated CDR. And basically, it's in vitro allergy testing using purified native or recombinant allergens. And so the sort of this table shows the pros and cons of different allergen preparations. And you can see in the first column with natural extracts, obviously it's much easier to prepare. And the problem, as I alluded to before, is that there's standardization problems. So there's a gamish of proteins, and so some of them um, through the commercial process may undergo degradation, and so you may lose some of those important um, epitopes, aller, uh, components in there. But whereas in native and al allergens recombinant proteins, the sort of disadvantage is obviously it's much harder to do. It's uh, laborious, and you, the yield may be um, more difficult to obtain. In the native form, the advantage is that you're going to have more of those post-translational modifications and hopefully inclusion of all the natural isoforms, whereas in recombinant proteins, you may um, have sort of lost that ability to capture those um, isoforms of post-translational modification, and that's uh, sort of a con for that particular um, form. So this is sort of a busy slide, but in the United States so far, the only um, commercially available CDR testing is offered by Fadia, Thermo Fisher Scientific. And they offer two different ways of looking at um, the CDR. So one is through allergen component packaging, and then the second is a mouthful alphabet soup called Immunosolid Phase Allergen Chip, or ISAC. And sort of the possible advantages of these um, testing is one, helpful, hopefully being able to determine the cross-reactivity between allergens and trying to understand clinically whether or not it's more, uh, what kind of risk the patients would have based on their testing. And, and with the ISAC testing, it actually uses a very minute amount of blood. And you can see further down in the chart that it only uses 250 microliters of blood, so it's basically a capillary test. And with that blood, they're able to test to over 51 allergens, and we'll talk a little bit more about what those allergens are. The matrix is a little different between the two studies. So in the allergen component testing, it's similar to the immunocap, so it's a cellulose sponge. Whereas in the ISAC, it's a biochip, so it's actually a microarray assay. The units 
for the component packaging, again, similar to the amino cap, so it's the kilo units per liter that we are familiar with, whereas in ISAC testing, they actually have made their own sort of um, uh, units, and it's called um, ISAC standardized units for ISU, so it's a little bit um, more difficult potentially for us who are, um, this, as this is a budding sort of technology. The allergen component testing also requires a little bit more blood compared to um, the ISAC testing, so you can see potential advantages for young infants where it's often harder to uh, gather blood and um, it's obviously less invasive and painful. The cost is really sort of the limitation, I think, of these um, studies. At, at this point, insurance companies do not cover these tests, so this is all out of pocket. So um, for the allergy component testing, it really depends on the package that you order. And as I mentioned today, we're going to be focusing on the peanut testing, and the one that FIDIA offers is called no peanut testing. And so their big thing is that it's the first and the only FDA-approved um, component testing for peanut at this point, and that cost would be $300, whereas the ISAC testing for a broader range would um, be the same cost. Um, the other difficulty of uh, obtaining this test is that um, it's e easier if you could do it within your um, own clinic site and draw the blood there. Many of the labs where I've sent patients, they won't just draw the labs um, and then send them since they're not being reimbursed for that. So it is, and at this point, a little bit less accessible, I think. So these are the different immunocap uh, food component packages. And you can see there's ones for peanut, egg, milk, wheat, kiwi, celery, Brazil nut, hazelnut, fish, soy, shrimp, and stone fruits. And um, as I mentioned, I'm going to talk more about the peanut, but I'll kind of briefly highlight sort of the potential advantages of using um, this component testing. So um, in other articles, um, they've shown that IgE to ovomucoid, which is found in egg, and casein, which is found in milk, that these levels seem to correlate with the risk of reacting to the baked forms of egg and milk, respectively. Furthermore, having elevated levels to these components seem to highlight a persistence of allergy in these patients. So if you're trying to look prognostically, well, am I going to outgrow this allergy or aren't, am I not? This may be a helpful way to um, guide those patients and families. <coughs> Um, in wheat, one of the components that's um, been highlighted is the tri A19, and this has been um, shown to be important in exercise-induced anaphylaxis as well as wheat allergy. So the higher the levels, in general, it seems to correlate with um, actually high, having higher severity of reaction and having a positive reaction. And in soy, um, the Gly M4, um, seems to actually be more related to birch pollen. So if you see this being present, then you can say, well, gosh, maybe you're actually um, just really allergic um, to the pollens, and that's why it looks like you're kind of cross-reacting. But it's a sort of caveat is that even though in general you may see more local reactions for these patients, still some, of the, some patients may have some systemic reactions. So in the end, you may still need to do an oral challenge. Whereas Gly M5 and Gly M6 seems to be a better indicator for the risk factor for severe reaction in soy. So this slide just shows quickly um, the uh, immunocap ISAC microassay. Um, and so you can see that it almost looks like a slide, and this is what the microassay has done. Um, you add the sample, the serum sample here, and then you wash just like with a, a regular ELISA, and then you come in with a secondary um, fluorescently conjugated antibody, and then using fluorescence, you can scan this entire chip and kind of get a nice uh, broad report at the, uh, looking at the various antigens, allergens. So for ISAC, the food components of the assay are the following. You can see that there's some fruits, um, celery in there, there's some nuts, Brazil nut, peanut, hazelnut, soy, sesame seed, wheat, milk, egg, carp, cod, and shrimp. And these are highlighted in red to kind of show you the um, cross-reactivity uh, possibilities. So in shrimp, you have a lot of the tropomycin um, that can be cross-reactive to other tropomycin in uh, dust mites. And, um, and so you can maybe look at the broader picture and kind of be able to tell for a patient whether that might be clinically relevant or not. 
The environmental components are also quite broad, so they have a little bit of grass, some tree pollens, weed pollens, dust mite, cockroach. Again, the red shows you the possible cross reactivity, and so here this may be relevant for the um, shellfish crustacean allergy. There's some um, animal dander, some molds, latex, honeybee venom, um, and so basically with this test, it may be um, useful for a patient who has um, extensive eczema, you're not really sure where to kind of look, and you can't test to everything um, because of either their skin being uh, poor or just sort of the nature of the challenge of having too many testing. And this may be a way to kind of get a look-see um, into that patient. So this slide um, shows the different peanut components, and there are 11 officially recognized components of peanut. Um, area H1, 2, 3, 4, 6, and 7 are considered the seed storage proteins, and so this is important for allowing for growth of the peanut. And um, the 2, 6, and 7 tends to be more heat stable. Air H5 um, is propylene, and it's basically um, a pan allergen, so you can see it in a lot of different plants and in pollens, and so again, this may be a possible cross-reactive um, uh, component. Here, this is also heat labile. Air H8 is a PR10, which is similar to the vet B1, and so again, patients who may have uh, birch pollen allergy may have some cross-reactive positivity to uh, our H8, and this particular uh, component is heat labile. And then ERA H9 is the nonspecific lipid transfer protein, and we'll talk a little bit more about its role. And then ERA H10 and ERA H11 are the uh, plant lipid storage bodies, and at this point, the function is unknown. The bottom portion of the slide shows you uh, the different components of peanut, with looking at increased risk of having an allergic reaction to uh, the peanut. So H one H1 to 3 are the storage proteins, and this seems to correlate with having increased risk to peanut. Interestingly, um, the allergenicity of these particular components seem to increase when you roast the peanut, whereas where you um, boil or fry the peanut, the allergenicity seems to decrease. And so you know, when patients ask you, why is it that we have more peanut allergies in America, you know, one of the thoughts is how we process the peanuts here, and this may be sort of a way to address that um, as well. Era H9, as I mentioned, is LTP, um, and this also seems to be important at correlating risk for clinical reactivity to peanut. But um, the other ones tend to be more pollen cross-reactive, and so sort of, again, marry it with the clinical picture. And then, as we know, proteins aren't just proteins. They are also glycoproteins, so they're sugar conjugated. And so um, in the actual um, FADIA test that's offered, they include... Um, the CCD to the MUX F3. So this is a particular um, a component of bromelain, which is found in pineapple. So it's a glycoprotein. And so it's a way at looking at cross-reactivity -re to glycoproteins. Um, so in the actual um, peanut component testing for FADIA, it includes the CCD, um, ERA, H8, 9, and 1 through 3. So there have been several studies trying to determine sort of the clinical relevance of looking at these particular components. And one of the important ones seems to be ERA H2. And one of the first papers that came out was in the UK. And this came out in 2010 in Jackie. And it was um, looking at a population-based birth cohort. And they measured the IgE to ERA H1 through 3 as well as ERA H. And it seemed that ERA H2 was really the one that seemed to show more of a predictor of peanut allergies. And when they did further studies trying to look at what level you would use as your cutoff, when they looked at 0.35 kilounits per liter, it seemed to provide 100% sensitivity, 96% sensitivity, which is pretty good. And then in a second paper um, in France, um, they had allergy clinics in France, 
they looked at the IgE2 whole peanut as well as ERA H1 through 3 and 6 through 8. And again, the one that correlated best was the ERA H2. And their cutoffs were actually even lower. It was 0.23 kilounits per liter of ERA H2, providing a 93% sensitivity and 96% specificity. Audrey, yeah. these are all oral challenges. Not all. Well, they orally challenged the mm. ones that were um, considered like positive. So for some, some that were positive, and some of them they looked at the negative group and then just made sure that they were truly negative. But I'm going to highlight uh, one particular study that came out this year that um, I think is a little bit more useful um, uh, in the sense that it's one of the first studies to look at the utility of H2. IgE to predict peanut allergy in a population study. It was also the first study to compare total peanut IgE, whole peanut IgE skin testing, which is what we do, and compare that with ERA H2 IgE. And so this slide shows the uh, selections study. So they basically had the Health Net study, um, so they, they enrolled about a year old infants um, in Melbourne, Australia, and then they skin tested them and they considered any ones that had a skin test greater than one millimeter, then the um, control was considered quote unquote positive, but they did ensure that these patients were truly allergic by doing a peanut challenge. And so those that were positive were uh, of those, um, 100 of them were randomly selected for ERA H2 testing, and then those that were considered negative were considered peanut sensitized but tolerant, and they were pulled together with a negative group, and this is the peanut tolerant group. So um, this slide shows the um, skin test of less than eight, um, and you can see that there are 43% with peanut allergy that, um, that were considered negative, but 57% that are positive. So if you have someone who's uh, uh, has a skin test of three um, or greater, then you, and not meeting the criteria of eight millimeters, then they're sort of in that nebulous category. And you can see that you would probably have to challenge 35% of them. And then using the cutoff of 15 as we consider positive, 26% would be considered positive based on in these studies, and 65% of those would fall in the nebulous category and would need to be orally challenged. And so you can see that they're not, it's not a perfect test, but certainly in the peanut sensitized subjects, you know, you have only about two, three percent of patients that are peanut sensitized and, but tolerant and would re that would receive the incorrect diagnosis of peanut allergy using the current thresholds of 15 for peanut IgE and eight millimeters for skin testing. So this is a kind of complicated statistical slide. So this is an ROC curve, and so this, the y-axis shows the sensitivity percentage, and the x-axis shows 100% minus specificity percentage. So ideally, you want a curve that goes through um, this upper left-hand corner, and you can see the one that kind of reaches <coughs> in that direction would be the error H2. And so if you look at the actual areas under the curve, indeed, that seems to be a better marker than the peanut total IgE and the peanut skin testing. And so when you look at standard cutoffs of uh, IgE to total peanut of 15, yes, that allows 98% specificity, but it only provides 26% sensitivity. Whereas if you use the error H2, you'll have the same um, sort of specificity, but it goes up to 60%. So this um, obviously looks more promising. And so in this um, slide, I'll just go briefly, because I know Dr. Springer's needs some time, is that basically this allows for, um, hopefully together with the idea of using skin testing and blood testing and the component testing, that you can have less patients that you potentially would need to orally challenge. And then at your leisure, you can kind of look at the next couple slides, but basically the point is that it seems it's regional, so we've been so, so focused on era H1 through 3, but um, it doesn't seem to be necessarily clinically relevant in Spain. So here in Spain, um, era H9 actually seems to be more important. So in the United States, um, patients tend to be more positive to era H1, 2, and 3, and as you can see in Spain, it's quite different. So um, at this point, you need, 
it's, it's a little bit difficult. So basically the, the pros are that hopefully it'll help the diagnostic accuracy, provide some insight and security, try to help determine who actually needs to be orally challenged, and at this point limitations of cost and accessibility is the problem. And then basically Halloween was just recently, and this just was a, a fun okay. venture of our uh, clinic at Issaquah. And that's me, Snoopy. <laughs> <laughs> Currently, the reference labs that we use use a negative <coughs> of 0.35, and that's considered a, a class one RAST if it's 0.36. But I don't think they measure air H2. I think they just do no, total no, peanut. No, so the only one you can do is through Fadia at this point. Okay. And you can't work with that. But like I said, it's a little bit limiting how to actually obtain that test. <laughs> so the other reference labs, they're not they're just measuring peanut. They're not Correct, measuring that's peanut. the entire peanut. Have you ordered this test? I have. I have. Okay. It hasn't been, um, as of yet, that clinically relevant for me. Cause, um, it's patients that I had a feeling, and, and their history was quite strong, that they probably weren't going to outgrow it and have their peanut allergy. But um, many families hear the buzz, and they, they ask about it, and that actually what stimulated me to learn about these tests a little bit more. It's still out-of-pocket expenses? Yes, all out-of-pocket. Okay. All right. For uh, our third... Uh, uh, area. I was on a dive boat uh, last week and uh, unfortunately not meeting my schedule suddenly discovered that uh, I was up uh, today. <laughs> so uh, what kind of triggered my mind was several things. Uh, number one, I had a dive where I experienced really bad air that was hydrocarbon uh, contaminated and when you're down to 60 feet and coughing and getting your own bronchospasm and you head into the surface, wondering what effect that's going to have on an asthmatic. Also, on several dive trips, I've noticed people using their inhalers both pre- and post-dive. So it raises the question again that keeps coming up uh, for allergists. What should we recommend to our patients that do uh, dive? There are about 9 million divers in the United States uh, that are recreational divers, and several hundred thousand get uh, certified each year. <coughs> There's about, according to Dan, which is the Divers Alert Network, there's about 1,000 uh, dive injuries each year worldwide, of which about 10% are fatal. And uh, when you look at the percentage of asthmatics in the general population versus asthmatics in divers, they're actually about uh, the same. Oops. I'll go back. Yes. All right. Just uh, some brief passages. Physiology, uh, both Boyle's Law and Henry's Law apply in uh, divers, and uh, one needs to pay attention to this. Boyle's Law is specifically because uh, the gas volume inversely uh, varies with the pressure. So if you're down at depth and you start accelerating rapidly to the surface, sometimes seen in uh, younger divers, you can get uh, air expansion. And if that air expansion happens to be behind some trapped uh, in small airways behind a mucus plug or something, that uh, can expand and then rupture into the tissue. A problem especially for asthmatics. People with cystic fibrosis, an example, should never die just because of for that exact reason. Henry's law, on the other hand, uh, also applies as the gas is, uh, is directly proportional to the, per uh, the pressure exerted on that particular liquid. So when you're down at depth, uh, nitrogen, especially in your tank, is going to be absorbed in the tissue and as you slowly ex um, ascend to the surface, that's going to slowly leak out. A rapid uh, ascent, however, can cause those gas bubbles to expand quite rapidly and uh, that can uh, cause problems. Also, uh, the gas bubble can uh, attract protein and can form a plug uh, within those small airways. In uh, scuba diving, chronic obstructive uh, lung disease, cystic fibrosis, bronchiectasis, interstitial lung disease, history of any type of thoracic surgery, or a history of pneumothorax, for whatever reason, should be considered absolute contraindications to diving. On the other hand, uh, the literature is a little bit variable on patients with asthma. Patients with active asthma uh, that are not controlled should not be diving. Um, even if they have a normal pulmonary function test uh, when they're seen for their kind of their dive physical. Uh, and part of this problem is because of the gas trapping and the uh, possibility of the gas expanding and rupturing on ascent. Asthmatics uh, at their baseline that have normal pulmonary function, well-controlled airway reactivity during exercise are really only minimally at risk uh, for barotrauma compared to the general population at large. 
that was one of the controversies initially thought about. The barrel trauma really hasn't been seen that much more frequently in the asthmatic patients. The uh, American Academy of Allergy uh, last year uh, uh, presented a survey that they sent out to all allergists, and they found that only about uh, out of uh, over 4,000 surveys sent out, about 12% of the members responded. And what's interesting in this survey is, well, 89% uh, of those that responded routinely asked people about sports activities. About only 10% really ask about activities that could be uh, detrimental to that asthmatic patient, such as scuba diving. And um, a third of those uh, were only uh, aware of some of the complications of scuba diving. It's not a sport that's uh, real common in a lot of people's repertoire. And uh, about, if you look at this group, a little over half would counsel patients uh, with intermittent asthma to engage in scuba diving with well control. 33 were quite adamant that they would absolutely say, if you've got asthma, no diving, period. And so this survey really showed kind of an honest difference of opinion uh, whether or not to discourage scuba diving in patients with asthma. And they felt that there was a need for a lot of further studies. However, looking at the literature, there are not a lot of other studies out there. This is an interesting study that was just recently published where they uh, took a group of divers and non-divers uh, that had a uh, history of uh, asthma and healthy divers, put them in a swimming pool only to a shallow depth, uh, about 15 feet, and uh, had them dive for 10 minutes. They did both pre- and post-pulmonary functions and found that uh, the difference pre-dive, that the asthma patients had a small difference in their FEV1, FEVC ratio, and their FEF2575. After they came out of the pool, there was quite a uh, larger difference uh, in the pulmonary functions. However, uh, this study was just uh, done on a small sample. It was done at shallow depth. It was done on one dive. And the group concluded that they needed to do uh, more larger groups <laughs> with replicate dives in deeper pools and also in the open water uh, situation. And uh, for those of you that are interested, all these pictures were taken last week on the different dives. <laughs> and uh, these guys were really a pain in the neck because they kept biting my fins. <laughs> um, and if you can't see the top picture, that's a rockfish that uh, you can just barely see the eyeball and a, a scorpion fish below. Uh, another case that was kind of interesting in the literature was an Italian diver that had dove numerous times. He was down. Uh, almost about 100 feet in depth, and suddenly had a severe asthma attack underwater, had to extend to the surface. He'd done uh, dives like this before and had no problem. And the question is, what triggered this asthma attack? When they analyzed his scuba tank, it was found that uh, it had been filled at a uh, remote dive site without any type of uh, air filter on it, and it was sucking in pollen uh, from the plant uh, Ferretaria which is a common weed in Italy, was in the tank itself and triggered uh, a, uh, both an allergic reaction. And he had uh, both positive IgE and skin test positivity to the same plant. So uh, another uh, <laughs> hazard. <laughs> um, diving, uh, most divers like to go to remote sites. And one of the things that they do right afterwards is they need to get home. Although you do need about 12 to 24 hours after your last dive before getting into an aircraft. Because if you think about it, when you ascend in the aircraft, you're, it's similar to being at depth and ascending up to the surface. You can have uh, gas uh, expansion. Um, and ironically, the first 10,000 feet in an aircraft is most critical. Not the upper altitude, but the first 10,000 feet. And this is... Uh, when most of the complications occurred. When I was doing hyperbaric medicine at uh, Travis Air Force Base, we had several pilots that went into the altitude chamber uh, to do their uh, studies, but then had to go up and over um, a, a set of mountains of about uh, 4,000 feet. And we had two pilots actually get bent uh, because of that. Um, and that was just driving home after uh, their time in uh, the chamber. What are some of the assessments that we ought to be doing as allergists uh, for fitness to dive? Well, basically, history, paying uh, particular attention 
to previous lung disease, previous chest trauma, and any history of pneumothorax. Those are rockfish, by the way. And uh, looking at pulmonary functions, uh, the uh, FEV1, FEC, FEV1, uh, FEC ratio should be about 80% uh, of predicted, and uh, the ratio should be greater than about 70%. Uh, percent. Routine chest x-ray is not really indicated in these uh, patients unless uh, due to OSHA standards, you're a professional diver or you're a recreational dive instructor, then it is recommended that uh, a chest x-ray be done. Um, Routine measurements uh, with a flow loop or, and exercise testing or uh, provocation testing are probably not considered necessary unless the history uh, is suggestive that, uh, that it needs to be done. There are three different um, schools of thought around the world, the Australians being the most conservative, the British being probably the least conservative, and the United States is kind of in the, uh, the midline. but. Uh, Based on the current studies, this is kind of just an algorithm for assessing uh, fitness to die uh, on patients. But especially looking in the history of previous lung disease is, a, is probably the biggest difference. Yeah. And uh, evidence for uh, uh, pulmonary barotrauma trauma or DCS in asthma patients um, most of the studies where they've looked at this are probably biased, especially the surveys done by the Divers Alert Network, because most people don't acknowledge they have asthma or you're only surveying people with very mild asthma. The severe asthmatics are probably self-eliminated from any of these type of studies. But again, uh, in Australia, every diver has to pass a, and have normal spirometry before they can actually be issued a dive certificate, so they're the most restrictive. In the United Kingdom, um, as uh, long as it's a well-controlled, mild asthmatic that doesn't require a bronchodilator uh, within 48 hours, they're allowed in the water. And uh, in the United States, um, it's a little bit less, uh, kind of mid-restrictive, mild to moderate, well-controlled asthmatics, normal screening uh, spirometry, both before and after exercise. However, um, most of the papers I reviewed Note that medications uh, used to maintain normal spirometry is not considered a contraindication to diving. And uh, my favorite, whale sharks. <laughs> so advice to asthmatics, not to dive if uh, they have wheeze precipitated by severe exercise, cold or emotion, and it is very cold underwater. Uh, exercise can be a real problem when you're underwater, especially if you're in a strong current. And uh, permitting to dive if they're free of asthma symptoms, normal spirometry, and uh, if you do uh, do an exercise test, uh, there was less than a 15% drop. Uh, asthma patients should probably be, uh, if they're divers, monitoring themselves with peak flows twice a day. And if you find a variability of about 20%, they shouldn't get in the water. Also, if they have any active symptoms um, and they're using uh, rescue medication from the previous 24 hours before a dive, then that dive ought to be aborted for safety reasons. So, okay, I've also, is the depth matter? I depth really much. does not matter. Uh, actually, the first 10 feet, as you go down, on, uh, or the first, uh, actually 33 feet, if you're going underwater, is actually the most critical for dive injuries. That's why you find uh, people in swimming pools when they're doing their basic certification courses can get dive injury. And it, uh, at the lower depths, you get into other problems such as nitrogen narcosis, uh, and, um, or if you have a problem, you start to do a rapid ascent. But it's that actually, the first 33 feet that's the most critical. What's the pressure in a commercial aircraft, and how does that compare with the length of depth of dive? Uh, standard pressure in commercial aircraft, depending on the aircraft, can uh, range from about, uh, on the newest models, around three 4,000 uh, feet. Uh, up to uh, 8,000 feet, depending on, on the particular aircraft. Most aircraft are pressurized below about 8,000 feet. And what kind of depth of dive does that correspond to? It, it doesn't correlate because uh, air is compressed differently than uh, uh, air in, uh, in the water. I think your previous slides had medications used to maintain normal spirometry. Is it a is not considered a contraindication. So if somebody's stable on their advarial, it'll be a second time. That's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. 
The state of California was taking this up at a legislative level, whether to allow divers to certify with the Institute of Asthma. Has that ever been resolved? Uh, you know, I didn't find that when I was looking in the uh, any current papers on that. Uh, it still gets bannered uh, back and forth uh, consistently, but looking at the most recent uh, um, and talking to uh, last night uh, with the Divers Alert Network uh, medical office, um, their feeling right now is in mild uh, to uh, well-controlled uh, asthmatics. Uh, as long as they're paying attention, they uh, they are not permitting them, they're not prohibiting them from being certified. However, the ultimate decision is actually the patient, and our job as providers is basically to let them know the risk and benefits of what's going on. And, uh, and then letting them make that ultimate decision. Um, but again, patients that have other complicating factors, uh, asthma with COPD is, uh, as an example, cystic fibrosis, um, previous uh, pneumothorax, uh-uh, no way. Jay, with the number of incidents that you noted, that must be a fair amount of liability on the, on the doctor seeing the patient. Well, that's just diving in general. That's yeah, just that's diving in general, general. yeah. yeah. So I but think if you actually, my risk sport. yeah, if you actually look at uh, the number of uh, asthma patients versus normal patients or normal people diving, and you look at uh, incidence of uh, adverse uh, events in diving, there is really no statistical difference between either group. So, uh, more common causes or rapid ascent, um, uh, getting bad air, as an example, or. Uh, doing some sort of buffoonery underwater, forgetting to hook up your hoses, forgetting to turn your air on, jumping in the water, a lot of other things going on. Taking pictures of fish. Now we can refer these to you, Jay. Is it, hey, Jay, have, has anybody studied those divers that go down two or 300 feet that free dive? Um, you know, I was looking for papers on that, and I haven't found a good study on that yet. And that's an interesting group of folks. Um, one of the things I did find, though, that uh, in free divers, they seem to have a much larger uh, 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 residual volume. But with time, in some of the people that are uh, pearl divers, that are free divers, etc., what they find is that they start to age, they start to show more small airway uh, uh, narrowing and uh, disease in the end. So. But they don't show any of the nitrogen narcosis when they go down 300 feet and then come back up? With no, because they're taking, uh, they're not breathing air that is compressed as they're going down. They're taking a breath, holding it, going down, and coming back up. So that actual volume that they inhale gets compressed down and then comes back up. But um, it doesn't seem to be uh, much of a factor. Remarkable. All right, thank you, everybody. Okay, next week we've got a guest speaker.